Good morning, everybody. We will be, the Ruby Committee will be introducing the speakers before each talk uh, today and tomorrow. So I'd like to introduce Joelle Kenville. Joel has been writing Ruby for over a decade and is the co-host of the podcast, The Bike Shed, where he and his co-host discuss the technical and social issues that surround our craft. Please give a warm RubyConf welcome to Joel Kenville. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, the current time is just a little after 1030. And that's the easy answer to the question, what time is it? But this morning, I want to ask a slightly different question. And that is, which time is it? Now, time has a variety of meanings in English. We use that term to refer to multiple different quantities that are similar and related, but also distinct. And choosing the right one for our code has, helps us have better designs and helps us to avoid bugs. A classic example of this is the difference between the code one.day and one.day.ago. If you have a method and you want to pass an argument a uh, piece of time, you have to choose. Do you pass one.day or one.day.ago? Well, not only are these two different times, they're two fundamentally different kinds of time. So what's the difference between one.day and one.day.ago? Well, we're looking at two different kinds of time here. The first is what I'm going to call a moment. This is a point in time, a value like November 14th, 2023 at 10.30 AM PST. That's the time this talk started. But there's also a different kind of time, what I'm calling a duration, an amount of time. So something like 45 minutes. That's the length of this talk slot. Let's try to visualize a little bit of the difference here, because it's not always intuitive. Imagine we have a timeline. So we've got our tick marks, and it just kind of extends infinitely into the future and into the past. Well, moments would be points on that timeline. They're discrete points. Durations, on the other hand, are distances. So we've got points, we've got distances, and some of you might be getting really excited right now. You're like, oh, we've got this, this graph, we've got points. He's going to talk about vector math and 1D vectors. That's not what this talk is about. Although if you're excited about these, come talk to me afterwards. I'd love to have that conversation. So this is RubyConf. And Ruby provides us several classes for working with time. The first is the date time class. This is a class that is used to represent moments, points in time. But I don't recommend that you use it, because as of Ruby 3, it's been deprecated. That's OK, though, because there are other classes that we have available to us, including the perhaps confusingly named time. <laughs> time also represents a moment, a point in time. And it represents values like November 14th, at uh, 2023 at 10.30 and 5.12345678.9 seconds AM Pacific Standard Time. So why all those decimal points? Well, it's because time has nanosecond resolution. Those two sound like fancy words. But really, all that means is that on our timeline, the tick marks are only one nanosecond apart. And so when we create two instances of time, we can create two separate instances, and the closest they can be to each other is one nanosecond. Contrast this with something like the date class. Date is also representing a moment, a point in time, but it represents moments like November 14th, 2023. No more details. This is a resolution of one day. So the same thing, we've got our timeline, we've got our tick marks, but now they're a little bit further spread apart. Two instances of day can be at closest one day apart. Now, this is a really fun thing about resolution. Uh, if you use uh, date or time instances in a Ruby range, 
you will get, uh, it will generate an array of values that are spaced out based off of the resolution of the type that you chose. So you may not have known this, but if we do a start date of uh, November 12th and a start date of November 11th, put them in a range and output them, we would get uh, November 12th, 13, 14, and 15. This can be really convenient. And if we'd used time instead, we would have just gotten a million uh, instances representing all of the different nanoseconds between those two points. And that can be really nice because you can play around with that and even create your own classes that represent different resolutions. Uh, one that I've done in the past is create a class that represents months. So there's still moments, there are points in time, but the resolution is one month. And that allowed me to do some easier reporting by leaning into uh, this syntax. Now, this is not a talk about enumeration. Uh, I gave that talk last year at RubyConf Mini. Uh, if you're excited about what you can do with enumeration and ranges, uh, look it up. It's on YouTube. It's called Teaching Ruby to Count. One thing I do want you to notice, though, about all these classes we've been looking at in the core library is that they all represent the same kind of time. We've looked at date time, we've looked at time, we've looked at date, and they all represent moments. We haven't seen a single thing that represents duration yet. What's going on here? Well, Core Ruby likes to represent uh, moments using the date and time classes and tends to use numerics for things like duration. Numerics are values like integers and floats. And that becomes important once we start trying to do math. And we are going to do a little bit of math. Part of why it's really useful to have values that represent time in our code is that we want to not just represent them, we don't want to just have a string that we can display to people, but we want to do math on this time. We want to ask, how big is the distance between two points? If we want another event so far in the future, how, what is that event going to be at? We want to ask which of these two events is before the other. And we can do all of this with math. Now, unlike regular arithmetic, where you might be used to saying, oh, we've got four standard operators, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and any two numbers can be combined using those operators, uh, time works a little bit differently because not all math operators make sense. We're going to do a bit of a dive into the time docs and look at some of the signatures for the operators because if you start reading that, you'll see that they're a little bit interesting. Starting with a time plus operator. So, the plus operator has a signature that says you take a time and you add it to a numeric value, that is a float or an integer, and what we get back is a new time value. First thing to notice, we can't add two time instances. And that would have been my first assumption. You're looking at the time library, plus operator, you probably do a time plus a time, get back a new time. But that's not the case here. What's actually happening is we're taking a time and remember, the time class is a moment, a point in time, and we're adding a numeric, that is a duration to it, and getting back a new time, a point in time, a moment. So why can't we add those two together? And what is actually happening here with the plus operator? Well, whenever I encounter an operator and I don't understand the rules around it, I like to step back and ask the question, what question is this operator actually asking? What does this mean in the real world to do plus on a piece of time? Well, in the case of addition, addition is asking what point is, let's say, 45 minutes after point A. So in our visual timeline here, we have a point A, we have some distance, and we're asking what point is that distance shifted over to the right? Now notice we're not adding two points together. We're taking a point and we're taking a distance, that's a moment and a duration, and getting back a new point. 
And that's exactly what we saw in the signature for that plus operator. And if we think about it in these visual terms, we try to ask ourselves, what would adding two points do? We start to realize that it's kind of nonsensical. Like, there's no way visually to think about what adding two of these points together would mean. Now, under the hood, uh, times are just numbers, and we'll see a little bit about that later. But it is possible to take a time and convert it to an integer. There's a 2i method. So if you really wanted to add two points in time, you could have point A plus point B to I. And that will work, and you will get a totally bogus answer to whatever question you're asking. <laughs> Don't do that. Sometimes thinking a little bit about what the operators mean help you to get a better sense of what your program is actually trying to do, or what it shouldn't do. And if you're at a point where in your program you're trying to add two points in time, maybe you need to step back a little bit and ask yourself, not just what is this operator doing, but what is my program trying to do? Why am I trying to add two points, and what is the bigger business problem I'm trying to solve here? And likely, it's not adding two points. Likely, you're trying to do something else, such as saying, I have an appointment uh, this afternoon, and somebody asked to shift it uh, to next week. That's not adding two points. That's adding some amount of duration. So we've seen the plus operator. The minus operator gets a little bit weirder, because if I'm looking through the docs, there are two signatures here. You can take a time, subtract a numeric from it, and get a new time. Or you can take a time, subtract another time from it, and get a float. First thing that jumps out to me, huh? two signatures? This is Ruby, right? We can overload operators. We can do different things depending on what kind of argument gets passed in. So what are these two different ways of using minus actually doing with our time? Well. As always, I like to ask, what question is this operator asking? And in the case of that first signature, it's asking basically the inverse of what the plus operator was asking. The plus operator asks, what point is, let's say, 45 minutes into the future? And the minus operator is asking, what point is 45 minutes in the past? And again, we can see that visually. We have a point A, we have some distance, and we ask, what is that point shifted out into the past? So just like with addition, it makes sense. We have a point in time, we have a duration, and those are the two values that we combine to get that third value. But what about that second signature? That one was kind of weird. Remember, I said it's nonsensical to add two points together. Why can we subtract two moments from each other? You'd expect there to be some sort of uh, being symmetric here, but it's not. Again, I'm going to keep asking this question. What is this operator doing? What is it asking? And when you're subtracting two points of time from each other, what you're actually asking is the question, how big is the duration between points A and B? Visually, it looks kind of like this. So on our timeline, now we have a point A, we have a point B, and the question is, how big is that distance between the two of them? And so between these two operators, what we have is three different questions that we've been answering about the data. But if you squint a little bit, you'll notice that it's kind of the same question answered in three different ways. What we have are three pieces of data. We have a starting point, we have an ending point, and we have some distance between the two of them. And these operators allow us to say, well, depending on any of these, if you know two pieces of that data and you want to know the third, you can use the correct math operator to get that third. And now some of you are probably having bad flashbacks to high school algebra class. This feels a little bit like solving an unknown in an equation. And uh, you're not wrong. 
what we actually have here is the same equation, and we're just rearranging it to solve for a different value. So when we're adding, we say to find point two, we can add point one and a duration. The first version of subtraction is solving for uh, the origin point, where we can subtract point two to get the dur and the duration. And finally, if what we're trying to find is the duration between two points, we can subtract point one from point two. Now the initial version of this talk that I, when I was putting it together, I wanted to call this an algebra of time and go really deep on all the different ways that the math operators work uh, and dig into some of the surprising edge cases where some combinations make sense, some combinations don't make sense. But I figured not many people would want to attend that talk. So instead, uh, I focused more on the idea of different kinds of time and building a better intuition around them. And one of the intuitions I do want to build is why certain operations make sense and some don't. Uh, and what you can see here is that because it's the same operation that's uh, rearranged three times, uh, just by rearranging this equation, we can see the two different ways that subtraction works and the one way that addition works. I didn't need to look at the docs for time. This equation shows it all for me. It also shows that you can subtract one point from another, but that you can't add two points together. Now, this is not the only set of math operations you can do on a uh, point in time, but these are the two that I wanted to dig into for this talk. One thing that is interesting is the way that the two types interact with each other. You're not just working durations with durations, or points in time, moments with other moments. But the two types, while they're separate, they do interact with each other. And they're not the only types of time. Earlier we talked about uh, resolution and how a date is like a time class instance, uh, but without the time part, it's just the date. But what if you need to do the opposite? What if you want a time without the associated date? Well, we've seen a couple different times of time. We've seen moments, we've seen durations, and what we're talking about here is yet a third kind of time. This is not something where you want to use the time class to model uh, time without a date. Instead, what you want is something called time of day. Time of day represents values like the generic idea of 5.30 p.m. This is Time decoupled from a day. And time of day works kind of like moments. They're points in time, but they're not points on a infinite timeline going out to the future into the past. Instead, you can think of it being on a circular timeline that just loops again every 24 hours. So how does time of day interact with the other types that we've seen? Well, our three questions that we asked about points in time on a linear timeline still apply. We can still do addition. We can ask uh, what is a point that is 45 minutes in the future. We can do subtraction, ask what is a point that is 45 minutes in the past. Although keep in mind that this is a circular timeline, so your answer might loop around again, uh, maybe once, maybe twice, depending on the size of that uh, duration that you ask. And finally, we can also ask about the distance between points A and B. Another thing that we can do is uh, take a, an instance of time, a moment, uh, that has precision that gives us uh, hours, minutes, seconds, and turn that into a time of day. So we can take a full timestamp and say, just give me the time of day for that, and then I will use it for future calculations. And we can do the opposite. We can take a time of day that's just a generic idea of 5.30, combine that with a date, and get back a time. So those are all useful, but Core Ruby does not provide us with a time of day class. 
Instead, we're going to have to go to third-party solutions. And Ruby has a great ecosystem of gems that provide us with a lot of tools for working with different types of time. One of the classic ones that we have is active support. If you've done any work with Rails, you've used this. And active support is what provides us with uh, syntax like one.day or one.day.ago that we saw at the beginning of this talk. So what is one.day? One.day uh, overloads uh, methods on the integer class, but what it returns is an instance of active support duration. So one.day represents a duration, an amount of time. This is different than one.day.go, because one.day.go does not return a duration, it returns a time. This represents a moment, a point in time. So not only are one.day and one.day.go referring to different times, they're fundamentally different things. They're not interchangeable with each other. And knowing which one to use is important when you're thinking about your code. And really what this gives us is a very nice human-readable syntax, some sugar, for doing something that looks a little bit more like this. You take time.now, it's a moment, and you subtract some kind of duration, the number of seconds in one day, to get one day ago. But what about time of day? Uh, this is a gem that I really like for time of day, uh, the Jack C slash TOD. Uh, time of day. Uh, it provides helpers for some of the math that you might want to do. Uh, it provides the ability to convert to and from other time types. And if you're using this in a Rails app, it also provides uh, helpers to register itself as a type to line up with uh, Postgres's time of day column type. Because Postgres has a time of day column type in addition to some of the other types that we typically see used for time. And this is a bug that I saw recently where if you don't use a gem like this and you have a time of day column type in Postgres, Rails by default will try to turn it into a time instance in Ruby. Now, this is converting from two different types of time. You're turning a time of day into a moment, which can lead to some weird behavior uh, because all of the instances of time of day get turned into time instances. They all get given a date of today, and then sometimes you start doing math on them or trying to compare them, and you get unexpected behavior. So I was chasing down a bug, and this was the, the root cause of it. And the solution was to actually convert uh, the column into instances of this time of day gem. But you can't always pull in third party code. Sometimes you have to do it yourself. So how might you implement time? Well, I'm gonna tell you how not to do it. <laughs> Avoid using human readable integers like 1030 to represent the time 10.30 a.m. Now this might feel like the intuitive way to do it, uh, and I've seen a lot of people do it this way, uh, but this breaks down in a few ways that are actually really frustrating. For example, it allows you to store invalid times like 3176. When is 3176? I don't know, it's, it's nonsensical, it doesn't make sense. It's an invalid value. But okay, maybe we can do some validations, we can get around that, we're gonna restrict the domain a little bit. Uh, but the real core problem here is that it breaks math. And remember, part of the reason that time is valuable as its own type is that we want to do math on it. So if we want to say, what is the number of minutes between 1025 and 925, uh, math will tell us it's 100. And I don't know, for all of you that passed uh, first grade, but <laughs> that's not the correct answer. It's actually 60 minutes. The problem here is that clocks roll over at 60 and our decimal system rolls over at 100. And so trying to pretend like time is decimal leads to a lot of problems. 
Here's another thing that I might recommend you don't do. Uh, don't store multi-part values like hours 10, minutes 30. What we're doing here is we're trying to take a human representation, something that we think about in terms of time as being like, oh, a certain number of hours and a certain number of minutes, and putting that into the computer. But that's not how the computer thinks about values, and that's not really how the underlying value works. What we've done is we've broken it up into multiple resolutions, hours, minutes, seconds, and lower. But these are just ways for us to describe it. In reality, a point in time is a single value, not multiple. And so by storing it in multiple resolutions, what you're going to do is give yourself more work when it comes to doing any sort of math, because now you've got to do weird carryover uh, into other columns. So what should you do instead? Well, the classic solution is to store an epic and a counter. So what does that mean? Well, the epic is really just what is the zero point of your time? And a counter is just going to be a straight up number. How many of whatever resolution you've picked since that zero point? Let's look at a few real world examples. A uh, common one that I'm sure all of you have run into is Unix time. This is the number of milliseconds since January 1st, 1970. Uh, January 1st, 1970, that's our epoch, and the counter stores milliseconds, that is our resolution, since that zero point. Another one is Postgres's time of day column. This stores the number of microseconds since midnight. Again, we have our zero point, that's midnight, and we have a counter that stores a resolution, in this case, microseconds, since that zero point. And finally, good old date from Ruby. This has a kind of an interesting uh, zero point, uh, the year 4,713 BCE. Not sure exactly why. And its counter stores the number of days since that zero point. So what if you're making your own? Well, my suggestion would be have a class that just wraps one big counter, something like this. So we're building time of day and we build here. It's a wrapper around a number. We pass in the number of, let's say, microseconds since midnight, and we store that. Now, because time of day is circular, we're doing a little bit of modulo math to make sure that we never go over the maximum number of microseconds in a day. But otherwise, this is just a Ruby class wrapper around a number. And this is the pattern that I am a big fan of in general. Uh, when you have numbers where you have to do some more domain operations, you have to do special math on them, wrap them in a class, make them a domain object, and then that allows you to abstract away all of that in a way that's really clean. Integers are great, but if you can build a class, that's what Ruby's built for. Ruby's an object-oriented language. And then because passing in microseconds since midnight is not the way we think of it as humans, we might create a custom constructor. Uh, and this would allow us to pass in all of the parts in the way that you and I are familiar with them. So we might construct a time of day by passing in hours, minutes, seconds, uh, the regular type of time that you and I like to work with. Under the hood, this method does the math to convert it all into microseconds, and then we just pass it into the constructor. And then finally, we might want to do a few math operators. Uh, here we've got the plus operator, and we pass in a duration. Remember, when we're doing plus on time of day or on moments, what we're doing is not adding another moment or time of day to it. We're adding a duration to shift it into the future. So we pass in here a duration in microseconds, and here's where that single counter implementation really shines because all we really need to do is add that new duration to the underlying counter and return that in a new instance. No need to carry values over from one column of minutes into hours. We're not even having to do any modulo math here because that's handled by the constructor. This is really just doing addition, wrapping it in a new class so that it's immutable and returning a new instance. 
So the single counter approach really shines when you're trying to implement any kind of time. Here we did a time of day, uh, but I mentioned earlier that I've done the similar thing for a moment where the resolution is months. So picking a number of months, uh, maybe months since January 1st, 1970, and you implement a few operators on it, you allow it to play nicely with Ruby's range, and it just works so beautifully with the rest of the e Ruby ecosystem. So I want to talk a little bit about a project that I did that really got me into understanding some of the nuances of working with time. This project was working with a researcher who was uh, doing studies with uh, people. They would be doing a sort of mini therapy session uh, and they would be wearing a few different sensors and they would also be uh, filmed. And what she had was a bunch of time series data from things like heart rate, skin sen sensitivity, things like that, and a video. And she wanted to find out what are the parts of the data that are interesting that I want, want to do more quantitative analysis on. The project that I built was a series of time series graphs and a video, and I had to sync all of this data up together. And each of these streams had a scrubber on it so that you could, as you move the video, it would move the scrubber on the time series data, or you could move the scrubber on the time series data, and it would move it on the video. And this allowed you to say, oh, there's a spike here in heart rate. I wonder what's happening here. And you would move the scrubber there, and then you would be, oh, I see in the video, it's because someone walked into the room and the person's heart rate went up. Now, when dealing with this, this is all time-based, and the points in the time series data are all Unix timestamps, so milliseconds since January 1st, 1970. Syncing it up with the video, though, is a little bit different because the video is not anchored in time. Instead, any timestamp I get from the video are going to be seconds since the beginning of the video. Now, there's a couple things that uh, might catch you out here. One is the difference in resolution, milliseconds versus seconds. And I absolutely made that mistake. You get, you're trying to find an offset between two things and all of a sudden you're off by a factor of a few thousand. Uh, that doesn't look good at all. But also trying to line up uh, the video, trying to translate those points that are relative from the beginning of the video to points that are relative to January 1st, 1970. Finally, what I had to do is, when we found an interesting bit of data, we wanted to be able to highlight it and then just export that particular segment from the time series. This is involving a start point, an end point, and a duration between the two. I wonder if you've heard a little bit about that recently. And making sure that I'm doing the math correctly between those, uh, was really important. Uh, there's a point where I was doing durations in the wrong units, and again, that led me to exporting way more data than I meant to, uh, and sometimes not syncing correctly across the different graphs. So when we're working with time, a few things that I like to think about are, first of all, what kind of time do I need? Am I dealing with a moment, a duration, a time of day? Knowing what kind of time I'm dealing with allows me to better think about the problem that I'm solving, better model what I'm doing, and then also pick the right operations, which is the next thing. What kind of operation should I be using? And does it even make sense? Are you at a place where you're trying to add two points in time? Maybe it's time to step back and think a little bit about what your program is actually trying to do. And if you're ever faced with a math operator where maybe the library that you're using doesn't offer the math that you're trying to do or the types don't line up quite well, step back and ask, what is this operator trying to do? What type of question is it answering? And then maybe step back as well and ask, what is my program trying to do? Finally, it's useful to think about resolution. What kind of units do you need? Are you looking for something that goes down to the nanosecond? Do you want something that's at the day level? Maybe you want months or years. Thinking about those can help you 
better think about the problem that you're trying to solve as well as your implementation. Thank you for coming to this talk and thinking a little bit about time. Uh, my name is Joel Kenville. I'm a principal developer at ThoughtBot. I'm also a co-host on the podcast The Bike Shed, which you can find at bikeshed.fm, and on the social network, formerly known as Twitter, <laughs> you can find me at Joel Ken. Thank you very much. <laughs>